Welcome to my talk. Today I'm going to be talking about InfoSec for Everyone and how to build security into the software and for developers specifically. So that's our talk today. If you're horribly misinformed, there's another talk going on over there. So if you need to flee, now is the time. As previously mentioned, um, I work as the head of security for a medical company. Um, and that's my Twitter which I have been told is important to have on my presentation. I am still not exactly sure why, but there it is. I tend to answer a lot of questions on Twitter, so if you have a question, you can always DM me, um, and I will try and help you. And I describe myself as a security enthusiast, which means I really like my job. And uh, specifically, I like trying to get more people into security. That's, that's my personal passion in life is to try and bring more people onto the security train. There's not enough of us and more of us are necessary. So hopefully my personal goal for this talk is that someone will walk away from it feeling like they, they can do security or that something is security is something for them. So um, general poll, how many people in here work with security? So I can't really see, but I'm going to go with like 15 roughly. And how many people in here know that security is probably something they should know about or should do? <laughs> and that's kind of my problem statement because everyone's like, I know it's something I should do, uh, but the dude over there is probably doing something because I personally don't have to do anything, so I'm cool. But we're all aware that it's something that should be done. So I'm trying to bridge that gap, so to speak, by speaking directly to developers rather than developers' bosses. So this is a monkey. <laughs> yes. And this is not some developer joke. This is actually a monkey. Um, so this isn't some veiled reference. But um, MIT did a really, really interesting study um, a while back on the way we remember things, looking specifically at the way monkeys create memories. And what they learned from the study is that when a monkey does something correctly, the brain actually remembers it better in a memory pool. Whereas if the monkey makes a mistake, they have a harder time remembering the mistake. So what your mother actually told you, that practice makes perfect, is actually scientifically true. So when you do something correct, you have an easier time remembering it than when you screw something up. And this is really interesting when you're talking about security because my job is figuring out where we screwed up. And if my brain has a harder time remembering things I screwed up, my, heart, my, my job becomes that much harder. So how do I prove the negative? How do I prove that bug, that thing, that thing? How do I do, how do, how do you, from a security perspective, prove that it worked if the proof is nothing happened? It's a very difficult case to make. And this has been true for a lot of security. And what's interesting in security is that it, it goes all the way down to the wire, but it always goes all the way up to the user as well. So it's, it's impossible to say that this part doesn't need security or this part isn't affected by security. One of the more interesting cases of this is the Enigma machine. Everyone knows what the Enigma machine is. If you've seen the, I think it was the Intimidation game, the, oh God, it was about uh, Turing. Imitation game, thank you for saving me from that horrifying movie. Anyway, it was a very good movie. And what the movie said was that the reason that Turing broke the Enigma machine was that they realized that there was some guy out there that was using the same phrase, Heil Hitler, in the same sentence, in the same sequence all of the time. And anyone that knows a lot about encryption realizes that having the same thing repeatedly that's identifiable is a problem. What the movie didn't go into was the way the, the Enigma machine actually encrypts things. And it's actually a key pair. There's a day key and there's a message key. And the day key was used to encrypt the message key. And most people that know a little bit about encryption realize that this is a lot of the same type of encryption that we use today. It's not that far removed. But the day key was five characters. And the person creating the day key was a person. So security would say, OK, create a random key. You know, don't one, two, three, four, five it. Don't QWERTY it. Don't A, B, C. And I'm pretty sure in calm circumstances, that's exactly what was done. But Enigma was used during a war. Not exactly the calmest of circumstances. So what is the likelihood that the people using the day key used security in the day creation, which was necessary to encrypt the entire message? Probably not super high, unfortunately. 
And it's, it's, it's a human thing to do. But if we're looking only at the technical implications of Enigma, the, the encryption was actually very good for that time. It's gotten a lot better since. But for the time, it was actually very good. And this is where security gets stuck. I have been doing this for a very long time, and I hear these phrases on a nearly daily basis from my developers and from people that I work with and from people online when you're talking about a bug. <laughs> and the first phrase is, this will never happen to us, which is a phrase that drives me absolutely bonkers because it assumes that you know what everyone else is doing. And so you see a lot of websites that don't have credit card information, that don't have personally identifiable information, that don't have data that they have deemed, and that's important, that they have deemed of value. But every single website has something of value in its reputation. Phishing is still one of the most effective ways to hack someone, and you can use a trusted website to use its reputation to actually fish other people. So this sentence is just not true. And then my other favorite phrase, and this is one I hear from developers, is I personally would never do that. And this is the reason I don't use a lot of code when I present. Because when I do, I can see on the faces of the developers, they go, I don't use that language. I don't write that way. I don't use that library. And they stop listening to me. And, and, uh, it's, and maybe that's not true for you, but I see a lot of it. And I see, it, it's, I'm, I see enough to know that it is true. And let's pretend, for the sake of my argument, that even if you do use the language used in my example, and you don't write that way, you write with other people, and you use other libraries, and you don't, your code doesn't execute in a utopia that touches nothing. So even if you personally would never make the mistake of that particular bug, your colleague might, and your colleague's mistake will affect you. So your particular security expertise in a larger context is frankly, unfortunately, irrelevant. And that's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult argument to have with someone that is so focused on, on their specific thing. So I want you to keep that phrase in mind as we continue with, I never would do that. Because I'm willing to sign off on the fact that you never would, but your colleague might. So let's, let's think about that one. Security has a terrible reputation, and this is usually the response of people when they find a security bug. Um, it's not glamorous, it's not sexy, and the instinctual response from upper management, especially with GDPR coming, and everything else that's big and scary in the news, is let's throw a blanket over it and hope nobody else finds it. Because it's usually something bad, and <laughs> that if it got out, it would be bad, and you'd, you'd lose stock prices, and so the instinctual response goes the developer, the tester, whoever it is, or a security researcher reports it in, and everybody kind of panics. And they're like, oh God, oh God, fix it. And they're like, okay, well, we'll fix it a little bit, maybe. And then they realize, okay, upper management has found the bug. They've been reported about this bug. We threw a blanket over it, so now we have to make the larger fix. So they call in the experts. And the expert comes up, and the expert is usually a security consultant. He usually wears a tie and a jacket and pants without holes. And he talks a lot about the enemy. And he has a lot of very scary slides that don't include snarky, funny pictures. Um, and it usually includes a picture of a dude wearing uh, the Guy Fox mask, or my personal favorite, the ski mask, while he is coding, which is hot and itchy. And I don't do that. And it looks very uncomfortable, but it sells to upper management. Why you're wearing a ski mask, I still don't understand. But it's usually either a picture like this or the ski mask. Or at one unfortunate conference, I saw someone pointing a gun at the computer. And I was like, OK, that's OK, fine. Great. So he starts with the attacker. Dun, dun, dun. He sells this person as you know, the next Gucci or Guccifer, the next, you know, super mega whatever it is. And this is the person that's coming for your company. And here is the solution. Here it is. It's a lot of boxes. It's incredibly process heavy. Make your developers do this and your problems will be solved. Great, says upper management. 
my developers will love this. They love it when there are lots and lots of processes, piles of documentation that they must update. This is where developers shine. Yes. 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 It's, I work with developers. They tell me they love documentation every day. No one has ever, you know, threatened me or thrown things or, nope. Everyone locks documentation. So this is the plan, says upper management. Here we go. All right. So what is a risk? And then they bust out another slide that looks kind of like this. And this is actually a good slide. It's from NIST. Um, so we're going to be handling risk. Fancy. And so they bust out a slide that looks like this. And we can see here that non-server applications are 36% of the risk. Unclear what it means. We can also see that 41% is server applications. Also, very impressive slide, very frightening. And upper management is like, yes, we have to solve for the 41%. We want that's a, that's a big ROI. We will fix it, 41%. We'll do it. And, and then they're like, okay, so we have the big fancy slide. We got this risk item. Okay, we need something else. We need a pie chart. So here it is. How do we approach this? I, and then everyone's laughing like this isn't a thing, but this is a real thing. I've stolen this from other consultants. This is, this is honestly stolen. So here we go. OK, so we're going to be approaching risk. And we have application security issue-based short-term approach. Sounds very buzzwordy. I like it. Excellent. We're going to penetrate and patch. Unclear how, what that means or how we're going to do that, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to threat model. And we're going to code review, because apparently we don't do any of these things already, which sounds a little weird to me. But you know we're, that's going to solve the problem, OK? And then we got software security, holistic, long-term approach. Sounds expensive. We're not going to do that one. And here we go. So the developers, unfortunately, while upper management has uh, been working, have unfortunately died. Um, it's very tragic. They passed away, crushed under a pile of paperwork, and nothing ever happened. And thus ended the security battle. Problem solved, the 41% that was server applications went unsolved because all of the developer core was crushed under a pile of paperwork, tragically. And this is unfortunately a great deal of how security is sold. And I would argue that this is the reason that most people don't feel like I can put a hand up and say I work with security because who is inspired by this photo? Anyone? I can't really see you in the back, so yell if you're inspired. The silence speaks for itself. So I'm here to produce, to introduce, to demonstrate a different way that actually works for developers, that actually fixes some of the 41 mystery risk points that weren't actually ever defined, and that doesn't require a pie chart and this chart and you know whatever the hell this is. So this is a phrase that was stolen from the military. And it is 100% true. The battle is won by the side with better intelligence, which means that you have to understand what you are building. If you do not understand what you are building, you have a much larger problem, and I cannot help you. It's true, I can't. But if you understand what you're building, and you understand the dependencies, I can help you. So the side with a better intelligence wins the war. And what I do is defensive security. I started attacking systems, I now defend systems. And I can swear that a good defense is an informed defense. We are not trying to stop every single attack. We have to know where our vectors of attack that we can't defend are. But we may not be able to solve them, but at least we know about them. We know they're there. The monster under the bed is real, but at least we know he's coming. So we have to handle the risk. And this is something that people get really hung up on, but it's something that we do all of the time. So we have this lovely gate. Uh, trespassers will be shot on sight. There's nothing behind this gate worth dying for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most people looking at this sign would not jump the fence. Most people wouldn't, right? Anyone would feel like getting shot? Unless what was behind this gate was, you know, I don't know, their women, their wife and child, their husband, whoever it was, but most people looking at this would be like, I'm good, no thank you. We do this when we park our cars. If you're driving a big expensive car, you're probably gonna try and park somewhere not next to someone where the car is all dinged to hell. 
if you, ca if you drive a car that's dinged to hell, you're probably not too careful when you park. So looking at, or maybe you are, sir, I don't know. You looked a little, but maybe. But this is something that we do all of the time. And we can do that because we know ourselves and we know the amount of risk that we personally are allowed to take. And so what's odd to me is that we don't take this back into the companies when we're developing because we make assumptions that somebody else is doing it for us, which is odd because we are the people that are producing the code, that are writing the tests, that are writing the use cases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't take that risk assumption and leave it at the door. And because security has become popular, people have kind of tried to like shunt this off onto my department as if I have 18 arms and can do it for everyone and it's simply not possible. So I would argue that developers need to start doing this for themselves. And this is hard because they're like, I am not a pen tester, which is totally fine. You don't need to be a pen tester. And then they're like, well, I have seen you know, hackers present super things that I would never ever be able to find, and that is also fine. Because if we're looking at what we're trying to defend, if you're making a small difference, you're still making a difference. And so even by thinking, fixing small problems, those are still problems that are being solved. So where do you find them if, you, if you've never pen tested, you've never attacked the system ever, you've only built something, so where do you start? You have to have a battle plan. I think this infographic is super cute. So you start by gathering intelligence. So you actually start looking at what does my system do? You know, what dependencies do I have? With what databases do I speak? Who uses my system? How old is the code? When was it refactored? Was it this century? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By a show of hands, how many people can know, can hand to their heart, say they actually understand the systems that they're building. I'm gonna go with five, S okay, seven, seven. And we are, I'm gonna go with 100 people in here, maybe. So that, that's a little odd, don't you think? If you're building a system and you don't understand the, the system you're building, don't you think that's a little odd? And then you're gonna say to me, but my system is huge, huge. I've been here for 10 minutes and you know I'm right out of school, I've never developed before, whatever the case may be. It's not reasonable for me to know the entire system. And that is a fair argument. So hand to your heart of the parts that you've built in that system, how well do you know them? Raise your hand if you say you know your part of the system very well. Okay, so that's like half of us improvement. Okay, final poll for this talk. How many people would like to better understand their systems? Hand up. Okay, so still half. So like, uh, you know, half of you are just odd. I, <laughs> I'm okay with that. Maybe, maybe you just don't like systems, I don't know. But, and, and that's, you know, what, whatever makes you happy. I'm just, I'm just here to show you my thing. So you gather intelligence, even if you don't understand the entire system. You can make a secure, you can secure your portion of it. And it's easy to get bogged down thinking, you know, blah, 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 that's not gonna make an impact. And I want you to hold on to that thought and see if you can maintain that through my entire talk and hopefully I can change your mind. Hopefully, that's kind of my goal. So, we've understood our little part, you've understood your API, you've documented your API, you understand your server, your front end is understood, whatever your part is, you know that. You're gonna model that, which means you're gonna draw it out on a pen and paper, you're gonna use a threat modeling tool, whatever the case may be, and then you're gonna plan the attack strategy on your own little piece, and that's all you need to do. So how do you do that? First, you have to gather your forces. So this is a picture of me at work, gathering my developers, it's going very well. Um, yes. This is unfortunately the reality of working security at a company is that developers struggle with congregating. Um, so I do a lot of bribing. Um, I have a lot of stickers. I, I bring people coffee. I do whatever it takes. Just please, please, please talk to me tends to be my strategy. So here I am at work with my developer core. And the first question I have to ask on your little piece of whatever it is, 
whatever system, whatever API, whatever front end, whatever app, whatever it is, is how would someone get in? And most people can answer this question. And they're going to start with they'd log in somewhere, right? Everyone has to log in somewhere. So you write that down. And then, well, that is over HTTP or HTTPS. And well, you, you write that down too. And eventually, you're going to wind up a, with a list that looks something like this. And this is a library application that you know is just an example. And so over on the left, we have how people can log in. And then we have a description of what that means. And then we have the trust level that is associated with that entry. And you write this down. Now, if you're smart, which I hope that most of you are, you're, you've realized that this is not a huge amount of documentation. You could probably do this on, I'm going to go with five post-it notes. This is a little verbose. You could easily just have HTTP port and then, you know, some, some credential done. So this isn't an onerous amount of documentation. Your next question that you want to ask then is, what do we have to protect? What do we have that is of value to someone else? And remember when I said that everyone has something of value, even if it is reputation. So please, oh please, don't get bogged down and we have nothing of value because we are puppies.com and all of our website is just pictures of cute dogs. Huge value to me, I love puppies. But you can't get bogged down and we have nothing of value. So you do the exact same thing again. You write down things that are of value. You write down your assets. Left is how they log in the description, and the trust level. Final question that you need to ask it during your intelligence gathering phase is what are the account types? What type of accounts exist for my particular part of whatever it is? And usually, my experience as a developer doesn't usually know. So this is where you can ask your testing department, because they do. But developers tend to make assumptions on what types of accounts need to use their things. So just experience says that this is where your testing department is going to really shine. And then you're going to make a list that looks like this, which is the name of the account and what type of account it is. And now I've lost all of the developers because they were like, this was three documents and you promised me no documentation. And I did, because documentation is where you lose people. It's necessary, but if you're looking for developers trying to improve security, documentation is not where you start. So forget what I just said. Do it. Just forget. All of that is relevant, but if you want to actually start with technical security, it has to be behavior. It has to be something you can do. And documentation isn't something you can do. It isn't necessary. And as you grow more mature, you'll do it naturally. But if you've never started with security, that's not where you want to start. You want to start with something like this. So this is the, the, the <laughs> this is the data flow of what I just told you in a documentation setting. So here we have the users, the libraries, the website, and the database. And every developer usually has this either in a note somewhere, in GitHub somewhere, in their head somewhere. But every developer knows what this is. Yes? You've drawn one like this at least mentally at some point. Everyone knows what talks to something else. All you have to do is draw little arrows that connect them. Now, what's interesting about this is see those little red lines that I've stuffed in there? Everyone sees them, even people in the back? That's where things can get screwed up. That's a tr called a trust boundary, and it's where a user interacts with the library website. And that is the place where security can get kind of funky. And it's the user input and the API response or the API to the database, or the database to the API, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're starting to look for something where security can get screwed up, it's where those red lines are. So if you're developing something and you know that your data is crossing that red line, you know that security has to be involved somewhere. And this is where you go to Stack Overflow and copy-paste. What? It's, it's, it's true. Then you can build this out. You can have the same data flow, but this is the login procedure. And the exact same principle applies here. You see those funky red lines. And this is, again, where security can get screwed up because you can see the user goes to the web servlet that goes to the, the forgive me, the login process. 
And the same thing here. How do you know that the, when the user tries to log in, that it is correct? Have you actually checked? What does that mean? And the nice thing about this is when you actually start looking at it in detail, you can start to create nice lists like this. And I know this is a teeny tiny bit of documentation. I said almost no documentation. So this is a post-it note that I've like blown up. I write really small. So you're just going to have to believe me that this was on a post-it note. OK? So we're only looking at session management here. And this is the nice little red line right there. So what I realized as I was doing this, we have to understand how the session is actually created for the user. Because that's where security can screw it up. Is it an unauthenticated or is it an authenticated? Where does that actually happen? Then we actually can look at things like the application track sessions and session invalidation. And if there's one thing that I can nearly promise that you're going to have screwed up, it's session invalidation. I have made so many bugs that it's just you didn't actually kill the session. You run a round round, you run a ra red robin server, you log into server A and you log out on server C, but you're still logged in the server A. You're logged in in tab A, you're logged out in tab D. The server is maintaining both sessions at the exact same time. Brilliant for penetration testers, terrible for products. And the way you find things like that, the way I find things like that is I go to that red line and then I just start making a list of how is this actually done and then I check. And the nice thing about security is it's not particularly hard. You just have to start asking yourself questions. And this is just a teeny tiny little process. This is just a little, little tiny session management process. This is probably the work of one or two developers at most, at most, if the, if the scope is very small. And these questions are things that you should be able to answer. And often security problems are solved by just asking the question, hey, did we actually invalidate the session? Because it's crossing that scary red line. And you look to your colleague, and if your colleague pauses and goes, I'm going to go to the bathroom, and then he pushes something, and he goes, yes, we did. Check the latest commit. Then you know you're probably onto something. And that's actually happened to me. I tell that story. That has actually happened. I've been talking to developers, and they're like, yes. And they come back 15 minutes later, and they're like, yes. If you check the latest commit, and you're like, this was 45 seconds ago, and they're like, yeah. It's been there all along. Like, yeah, all along, sure. And so this, this seems like a lot. And you're like, I would never figure out these questions. This is too much for me. I get that. And once you start with this, you realize the horrible, the horrible diff, the horrible, horrible diff between the front end and the back end. And I, I can't see it personally. Um, my heart will always be back end and I like monsters. But for some reason, when you're working with security, there's a slight problem with trying to secure both the front end and the back end. Um, I'm going to guess that it's because the back end is, shall we say, slightly less loved than the front end because no one sees the back end. But when you actually start digging in it, the, the back end is where all of the problems are. There, there be monsters that will affect the front end you just, you haven't seen it yet. So this is the most important slide in my entire presentation, and I know it's boring, but if you take nothing else away from this, take this one. It's start small, small. People, when they start getting into security, everyone makes the exact same mistake. They go to a talk, I don't know like this one, but they go to a security talk, and they get back to their jobs, and they're like, I'm going to solve everything because oh god our back end is a flaming ruin and i am you know jesus christ and they take on a problem that is huge and they immediately burn themselves out and i see it happen over and over and over and over again and it breaks my heart and and, and it's odd because when you start in development when you're a junior developer when you're brand new you usually have a mentor that if you're lucky holds your hand, and steers you towards projects that are appropriate for a junior developer. They don't set you on the most complex thing you have. They set you on something small. And so if you're new to security, and the hands that came up says, most of you are, I want you to think back to the time when you were a junior developer. Did you start with the largest thing you could find? Absolutely not. 
you started with something small. If you were smart, or you didn't, burn yourself out and then realized, I should have started smaller. So validation, something tiny, session management, making sure you actually invalidate the session. One of my personal favorites, the logout button. Does your logout button actually work? So another poll, I said I wasn't in any more polls, but now I'm just curious. How many of you here, if you have a logout button in your function, have actually checked that the logout button invalidates the session? Hand up. I rest my case. I can probably promise you that if I were to give it a good solid crack, I would find a solid amount of bugs, bad ones, because the session is still open. You push the button and nothing happens. I mean, the front end, ta-da! But if I were to talk to your API or the, the back end, it's like, oh yeah, you're fine. You can just push back right in, you're fine. Welcome back. And that, that's a tiny thing. You can go back, you, I mean, you could pick up your laptop right now, ignore me and check. I wouldn't be offended. But it's tiny, tiny things that you can do that actually do make a significant difference. Free text fields. How many people in here have sandboxed your free text fields so that I can't stick injection attacks into them? The silence speaks for itself. Again, tiny things, tiny, 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 but all worthwhile. When you start out, this is generally how it goes. Um, and you feel like you're just like, oh God. And, and I'm here to tell you that that is totally okay. This guy is having a hard time. Um, security is not this violent, but everybody starts somewhere. And, and the idea is you have to start small and you have to be okay with, with failing at it. And that's totally acceptable because we, myself included, have all been there. Which is why I wanna talk about my lovely assistant. Um, he is a back-end developer. His name is Lewis. Um, and he has been my assistant for two, two and a half years now. <laughs> and this is him at work. And Lewis is probably one of the kindest, most open-hearted, warm, sweet people that I know. And I adore him. And he has been working security with me for, for like I said, two and a half years. And when he started, he went to a talk, he started hanging out with me, and he's like, I'm gonna fix it. And I ran into him like a month later, and he was like pale, and he was just like, oh God, it's unfixable. And he just, he gave himself such a hard time because he was, he is a senior developer, he's very talented, but from a security perspective, he's still very new. He's not bad, he's just new. And, and his biggest problem is frankly that he's enthusiastic. Um, but he didn't heed my advice of start small. And so he wanted to fix everything. And you just drive yourself nuts. Because unless you're the person that's built the entire back end and the entire front end and you work in a utopia where you have no colleagues and you can work 23 hours a day, that is an impossible task. So I say it again, start small. Security is not difficult. Security is asking questions and checking, asking questions and checking, asking questions and checking, and looking at those red lines. And that is not a sexy way to sell it. I don't have a ski mask. I have a Guy Fox mask that someone got because they know how much I hate that. So they got it as like this horrible white elephant gift that I keep in my closet and it's a, an item of shame. So. You start with security and you realize that this is the scenario that you have because security hasn't been actually given to developers as something tangible that you can touch. So this is the back end, generally speaking. It's true, I've looked at a lot of them and this is generally the state of affairs. And what's interesting is that this is the burning of Rome. Um, and Rome burned and near the entire, the entire city was gone. And what's interesting about it is that the person that was blamed was Emperor Nero who was in charge at the time, but Emperor Nero did not build Rome. He just happened to be the dude that was in charge. And why do I tell that story? Because the people who built Rome probably weren't thinking about scalability. They probably weren't thinking about fires. They probably were thinking about, I put my brick, then, you know, I don't know a Roman name, but Roman guy next puts his brick, and all of the bricks need to line up because Romans were very famous for very nice roads. So all of the bricks had to line up very carefully. 
And what's interesting about that is the fact that all of the bricks lined up. But I don't think anybody ever said to them, the next brick has to line up. That was just something that was given. So I would argue if we say take the same principles to development when it comes to security, if you take a small step, tiny, validate one input field, check one session, please go check your login button. I just, for me tonight, just go check. That one tiny thing. And then you say to your colleague, I checked this tiny thing. Your colleague's probably gonna be like, oh, that's probably a good idea. I will check my tiny thing. And then he will say to his colleague, I checked my tiny thing. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting is after six months, you're gonna have a habit of just, I'm just gonna do that one tiny thing. It's true. It's true, unless you work with a bunch of jerks that just ignore you and no one helps one another and it's just, you know, it's just a hellscape. Then it's not. But in general, people are kind and they don't want to ruin someone else's work. So there's a great saying that the seals have in the United States and it is, how do you eat an elephant? And it is one bite at a time. And that is the way you must handle security. It is a monumental, massive task that has been oversold in a just a disgusting way by some security consultants. I am not one of them, I hope, please. But it can be done by absolutely anyone because anyone can validate an input field, check a logout button, sandbox an inbox field, check the red line. What does my database actually speak to? If it's HackerBot X, you should probably turn off that connection. If you have an HTTPS stream and you're posting HTTP traffic to it, you probably shouldn't do that. And those are small changes. Small, not sexy, no ski masks, Guy Fox isn't invited, but they are making a marked difference. So I've added some resources for you. Um, if you want to learn to actually attack systems, OWASP has a few tools that you can actually use that are very, very good. Uh, there's DevSlop, which just came out, which is, DevOps and backend related, it is set up to fail. So you can run it on a VM or you can run it in a container and actually attack it. And it has, you know, lessons, it has tutorials, it has, you know, these are the mistakes that these people actually made. Same thing with damn vulnerable web app, damn vulnerable iOS app, damn vulnerable Android app. And then there's another one called C Shepherd because hacking is illegal, don't do it unless it's against one of these things that are built for that specific purpose. OWASP has a lot of cheat sheets. So when you're threat modeling, you can be like, I am looking at authentication right now. That is my tiny piece. I know there is a red line. What questions should I be asking myself? Go to OWASP, authentication. There are the questions that you need to answer. No work required. You literally copy paste and you're done. Copy pasta, everyone can do that. CVSS and SANS critical controls are two different instances where they rank bugs and they rank risks for you. So if you don't wanna write up a risk report, you can go to CVSS and type in, I found a bug, it's on the network or it's on this, whatever it is, and CVSS will spit out a risk score. So you can go to your boss and say CVSS, which is a globally recognized risk register, says this is a critical thing, I need to fix it. No work required. ASVS and MASVS are automatic testing suites specifically built for security. What's nice about both of them is that they are documented and uh, MASVS actually is on GitHub. You can fork it right now and all of the work is done for you. It's just a fork away. And finally, there are ThreatDragon and there's Microsoft Threat Modeling Tools, which is what I use to make those little circles with the little arrows that you can actually draw your particular part of whatever it is. So it's a good idea to have that somewhere. If you don't wanna have it online, then you can have it on a post-it, on a whiteboard. I've never met a developer who doesn't like a whiteboard drawing. Whiteboards are always a good idea, I never have. And that was it. So I hope that I've inspired at least one person. I hope that was at least my goal. And I thank you very much for your time.